What is good, YouTube? This is the FF Dynasty coming at you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, like, and comment below with either love or if you're feeling like some hate, throw some shade down there. Either way, it all greatly helps us out so we can keep bringing you new content. Oh, you know what that sound is. It's time to get cracking. Matt Waldman is our special guest today. Thanks so much for joining us. Mr. Waldman, is that how, how, you want to go by Matt, Mr. That's, Waldman? Have yeah, you, I, Mr. Waldman, I, I, that might be my grandfather. <laughs> That's fair. That's Chris, fair. Chris Harris hit you with a Matthew. I don't know if he, he did that. I'll tell you why he did that, because I keep calling him Christopher by accident, because I have a really good friend who insists on Christopher. And so I kept calling him Christopher when he goes by Chris. So I think that was his kind of little He's dig to say, shots. make sure you say Chris next time. Well, you know, I said, yeah, and I explained why. And then he led off with Matthew and I wanted to laugh because I knew that's why he did it. <laughs> oh, that's that's fantastic. Um, well, you can follow Matt. I'm sure all of you already are at Matt Waldman on Twitter. Is that right? That's right. Um, and he's also known for his uh, his great work. It's a it's overwhelming at first when you when you click on it. But I've been go. reading since April 1st and I'm I barely made it through the running backs. <laughs> you could go check out his work uh, at Matt Waldman RSP dot com. Uh, and his rookie scouting portfolio is is insane. And it's a it's a, a lot of people in the industry already know about it. But um, I mean, I don't even know how you do it. So hats off to you, man. Well, I appreciate it. It's a you know, certainly was a labor of love to start. And it's gotten, you know, as, as it's gotten more successful, um, it's become one of those things that it's, you know, it's 15 years old. So I, it's kind of like a teenager right now. And it's, and it's a little unruly <laughs> and it's adolescence. It's, a, it's adolescence and it's causing Papa a little bit of headache from here now. And then, you know, this year I had to write 500 pages in a month. Um, which when I started doing this. It wasn't like that. Fortunately, I have an editing team and, and some really good editors, but, um, and anything that, that you do catch that isn't, um, well edited, that's my fault. Um, but, but, you know, again, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to do and it's a pleasure to get the feedback and um, that I get from people who, who do it. And I just love getting the chance to, to learn more about the game by going through the process of evaluating players. Yeah, well, before we get started, I have a bone to pick with you. You're on here. I'm the host and you're just you're out deep in the host right here. That voice is just you're just right underneath me. You're just I'm going to have to drop down a level and just <laughs> and and. Were you ever were you ever a, a radio DJ? You have a, a, you could be thrown it to Earth, Wind and Fire or Jethro Tull with no problem. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, it's if, if I didn't um, if I didn't stutter so much and, you know, have so many other things going on, maybe that might have worked out. But I was a, you know, so I was no a musician. college DJ. No, no, no college DJ. No, I was a musician. I played the saxophone. So, uh, you know, Ooh, I was playing in didn't I was playing in Latin bands and, and, and stuff in Miami, Florida. And, uh, and yeah, I was, I actually have to show you guys a picture one day. I'm like the only guy who's the non-Latin guy, in but, uh, <laughs> but I used to play, I used to play a lot of jazz and a lot of big band stuff and a lot of Latin music awesome. in, in, in clubs in Miami, Florida. And then, uh, you know, I did a lot of telemarketing and customer service type of stuff when I was in, in college and that ended up growing into a career. Um, so I did a lot, I spent a lot of time on the phone and, I've always had a low voice, so I always got in trouble in school because <laughs> I might not say much, but if I did say anything, the teacher obviously picked, knew it was. Picked you right out. Yeah, so that's how it went. All right, well, we let off last week, and we're going to lead off uh, pretty much all these interviews with getting just the background of, of our guests. We, we, I, want, I heard your story once before, I believe, on uh, Josh Norris's podcast, or at least a part of it, um, and I thought it was super interesting. Uh, so if, if you wanted to just give us kind of you know, your background, what drives you to do this, you know, all that kind of stuff. How, how'd you get here? All sure. that, uh, all that jazz. Yeah. I mean, I love football. I'm um, growing up and it was something that I, you know, I played every day, even regardless of the fact that I was a musician and, and I would, you know, I, I played a lot of, I played a lot of just backyard football, read about football a lot. I was one of those latchkey kids who, even when I was growing up in Cleveland, Ohio for half of my life, uh, or half of my, uh, childhood, I would sometimes I'd skip school and my mom would go to work and I would uh, and the day before I'd plan to go to the library to read about guys like Jim Brown and Gail Sayers and Bronco <laughs> Nagurski and I you know I'd sit there and, and I'd do that to read all day and then I you know 
hope I'd beg her to if I could go outside and play football with my friends. Of course, I couldn't because I made up that I was sick, so that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Got um, me every time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, that was part of it. Um, I was a big fan of it, and you know, I, I would like I said, I was a musician. I went to music school at the University of Miami. They had a jazz program there, um, and I, you know, I've, I've met a number of different people who were very successful in, in, in that field. My roommate was actually the youngest um, record executive, CEO of Virgin American Records. He discovered Matchbox 20. Um, his, the, the band that used to sleep at our house was Collective Soul. Um, yeah. And he was part of Collective Soul and produced their first album. Um, he's written songs with Willie Nelson, folks like that. Um, worked with, um, I'm trying to remember the guy. I can't remember the, the, the other guy. But anyway, you know, I realized I, I didn't have that level of talent as a musician and that the amount of work that I was going to have to do meant that I was probably going to be working, no offense to insurance people, but I was probably going to have to work an insurance gig and, and, and playing, night just gigs. Be playing night gig <laughs> club dates that I really didn't want to do. So I left and I, I did a little bit of journalism for all of like a semester at the University of Georgia. I covered the football team and I had a writer there. I, I worked at the newspaper and Everything I wanted to hear as a musician, I heard about as a writer from a writing coach who was a magazine teacher at the University of Georgia who used to work at Sports Illustrated and uh, worked there for 10 years. His name is Kent Hannon. And he, if, you, if you're my age or a little younger, remember Larry Bird, there was a, there was a University of in, Indiana State um, picture of him on the cover where he's like doing this with two cheerleaders on either side. And my, my editor wrote that story. So he told me everything I wanted to hear, told me I could go far if I wanted to be a writer. And that ticked me off because I wanted to be, be a musician. So I promptly left that. And I ended up, you know, trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. Next thing I knew, I was a director of, you know, I was a director of a call center industry of like a, a, a couple of call centers and in a call center industry that had a number of branches around the United States. And I, I developed these, I basically learned how to um, evaluate performance and do a lot of different quality work because I was um, promoted then to a director over quality for the corporation. Um, And they had me learn certain certification practices, best practices that are kind of world class, class practices for evaluating performance and how you document that, how you create those processes and, and how you score those types of things. So here I am starting to play fantasy football in a job that, you know, it was fine. It was a good job, but it wasn't really what I planned my life to be. I had done some writing a lot, but that was all kind of freelance type of stuff. Um, you know, for different corporations, I did some, did some writing. I did, I actually wrote a, a 20 minute performance monologue for the Ritz Carlton for a, for a resort in Jamaica that they performed for about 10 years with an actor and they did for <laughs> different things based on a, a true ghost, uh, quote unquote ghost story. Um, but I did all sorts of stuff like that. And I realized I wanted to write, been playing fantasy football since I was 25. So it was around 1995 that I started and um, realized that I kind of liked picking rookies that I was pretty good at like seeing rookies, you know, that, you know, that Terrell Davis, that guy might be pretty good. Maybe I should grab him or, uh, you know, and, and other Brian Westbrook and Larry Fitzgerald and Frank Gore and folks like that. And, and so I started writing about fantasy football and a couple of years into that at FF today, um, where I was at, I started this publication because I thought, wow, you know, I already have all the makeup for this. I'm doing this for a corporation with, you know, 70 branches and we're monitoring the entire group of people and cross section. I could probably apply this to football because the thing about the, uh, the process is about teaching yourself. You kind of through your monitoring, you learn what it is you need to adjust to understand how you need to define the criteria you have to get the most out of the monitoring process so that you're teaching people to get better at what they do, as well as you're identifying what the issues are and what's good or bad and, and how to go about doing that so that you reduce variation as often as possible. Um, there's, it's actually a very, as oddly as it sounds, it's a very analytically driven kind of process <laughs> um, because you're actually, you're actually trying to objectify as much as possible subjective material. Um, and so if you reduce variation, you reduce bias. And, and that's kind of what 
everything was based on with that. So I started doing that. Oh, the irony business. here. Oh, the irony, because most people <laughs> think I'm just don't like analytics at all. And I try to explain that's not the case. But, that, you know, most people who do understand analytics know that my process is heavily, heavily analytically impressed. Yeah, highly analytical. And it's so so I did that and I just started it out in 2006 as my first publication. And, you know, I kind of put myself in a hotel room and, and told 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 the family it was like I'm going to take a week and see how much I actually really like studying film and I spent almost 130 hours that week doing nothing but <laughs> studying film and I realized that I had the illness so I was like happy to do this and I liked it and um, I've been doing it ever since and it's grown into a full-time job and so you know I was balancing other things with that I've worked with you know I've been working at football guys since 2009 as a senior staff writer there work full-time there and then I the RSP became um, a job that I did along with um, being a features writer at the University of Georgia, where I was a, um, where I wrote basically for a magazine and helped edit a magazine with the guy who was a Sports Illustrated writer who who told me originally that, you know, what he told me, and then I promptly left the program. So it was kind of funny that <laughs> came full know, circle had, a little bit, came full circle, and he was my mentor for about 10 years. And and it was, you know, a great friend of mine, but it's been fun to be able to do this. And it gave me room to, to grow this business. So now I'm, you know, that's what the RSP kind of how that all kind of worked out. And, and, and it was just more of a matter of this is something that I wanted to stick with. And I really enjoyed it. And I felt like it served a purpose for the fantasy community, as well as I wanted it to be a football publication that first for football first with fantasy, something that people could read it and go, that's easily something that applies to fantasy, mm -hmm. but it's rooted in football. And that and it's worked out that way because I have scouts who read it. I have people in the league who read it. I've been told by people who recruit at the at the division one universities that when the scouts come in that they deal with on a you know weekly basis that you know I'm one of the two more two to three most read draft guides by by scouts. Um, in the NFL. So it's, you know, and I get, I do, I get notes from people from various colleges and, and things like that. Um, telling, you know, kind of telling me that they've learned a lot from some of the things that I do. And, and so, you know, kind of going from someone who had a lot to prove and people going, you never did any of this stuff to being like in the line of a Starbucks yeah. and John Elway in front of me and two former football players kind of turned their back on him and getting all excited about my my YouTube channel and saying they <laughs> learned more about skill positions than they knew. And they used to play O line in the NFL. And John always looking at me like, who is this guy was kind of, it's been, it's a, a crazy turn. So that's kind of right. The wild the, ride of it. People, people get all fired up. Well, you didn't play. So how could you know anything? And, and you're living proof of that. Was it, was there any, any, uh, any point where you were uh, almost done with it or, or you yeah. got frustrated or. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, when we had almost before the lockout, it was 2011. And, um, you know, I'd been working with football guys for a couple of years and they were really great about they basically I licensed it through them um, so that they could sell it and we would split the a percentage of that. But when the lockout came, things got a little bit more hairy. We didn't know what was going to happen. And, and it was understandable that we were going to keep things kind of separate. So I at that point, I was thinking, you know, I just don't know. I've been doing this for, I've been kind of knocking my brains out here doing this and juggling three jobs for a number of years. And I, and I want to do this, but is this really the best use of my time? You know, I thought I needed about seven years to make this work. That was the plan. And I was five years, five, six years into it. And I was starting to wonder, especially with the lockout and the unknowns. And um, a scout wrote me, um, and I had my wife had urged me to start a site, a, a blog myself, and that I should have done that for years ago anyway, because, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm a dumbass sometimes and decided <laughs> to, you know, I don't always I didn't listen to, to the smarter person in the family. So, you know, she she suggested that a couple of years prior and I wasn't sure about all that and it came time that it, I needed to make that happen. And around the same time, I got a letter from somebody who or an email from somebody who said, I've been buying your book for you know, for five years now, um, it's, it's, you know, your, your scouting at this point is not, 
you know, we're like better than people in the NFL. He said, but your process is light years ahead of what the NFL does. And I can tell you why started showing me scouting reports, started showing me different things that were happening in the NFL. And he said, the thing that kind of really got him a, about my work is that I seem to have a really good feel for what the NFL is truly about and not what the media was saying. And, and that he wondered if I worked in the NFL at first because of the things that I would talk about. And then he realized it had to do with my corporate experience that I just related it very well to what was going on in the NFL and drawing those parallels. And they were, they were spot on a lot. So he, he really, in, um, he kept me going because getting that kind of email, right. Just Even those when, little words of of encouragement and reassurance that you know you you hey I am good at this like I, I'm right yeah I'm heading in the right direction especially I just need- since there's so much hate out there all the time for yeah. just people love to spew hate that 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 you get those little words of encouragement that's awesome um one of the things I really enjoyed reading about in in the RSP was you kind of talking about your process versus the NFL and how they're like a machine that never loses and they're kind of stuck in their ways and so they miss out on a lot of players and talent slips through the cracks. And like you were talking about Arian Foster and how you let, you let the the public kind of get you down on him when you knew you really liked him and you learned from that and decided just to like do your own thing and move forward. Um, I thought that was really interesting. That's something most people have to realize. Like we, we have gone through that, like just ignore what everyone else is saying and kind of just do your own thing. You do. And you're right about that, Jay. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, at first, I you think you would know that lesson when you first do it, and you're like, "I really like this guy, Mike Bell, out of Arizona. He's a running back, and and he didn't even get drafted, but I had him rated six overall in my first publication." And and then I'm like, "Well, you know, what do I know?" And then he ends up becoming a UDFA starter for the Broncos that year um, due to injuries, but also due to his talent. And it was kind of like, "Huh, okay, maybe I should keep." But the thing is, is that every year the pressure of seeing what other people think and also the weight of people more experienced than you saying things, it could cause you to lose your compass. And you really, you have to remind yourself. It's kind of like, if you have a process and you're going to, and you're really methodical about how you go about doing things, you better just stick to that because otherwise you're not going to learn as fast. If you just let the wind blow and go the direction where everyone else is going and there's no rhyme or reason behind it that you can really document or create and you're going to end up going to be on a slower path to learning. So I'd rather just like completely screw up on a player and two to three years later, look back on it and go, all right, I screwed up on that. And, and I also see where I screwed up on this part of this player. How do I need to address it? How do I need to work on it? And that's part of, and, and, and you learn that you learn faster. It's more ingrained and you know, you own your process because everybody screws up. So it's like, you know, and when people, when people go off and talk about that, you just kind of have to realize that it's like they're, you know, I think one of the first things I've written at the RSP blog is about losing your football innocence and how to watch football. And the idea is shedding the football genius label because any casual fan thinks they're a football genius. No profession, you know, I think everyone has a profession where it's like someone thinks they're a bigger expert than you. Like, I'm going to joke about my dad. My dad is a wonderful man and he's an opto- a retired optometrist. Great guy. My father-in-law is a former um, undercover detective for this um, city of Baltimore. Um, like if you've seen the wire, he lived the wire. Okay. I'll just put it to you that way. He also was a gun instructor for the police officers um, for the Baltimore police for a while. So we're all having a conversation over my daughter's um before my daughter's wedding at breakfast and they're talking about guns and my father's like, like kind of like debating my grand, my, my father-in-law about gun instruction. My father taught me how to shoot. He knew how to use a gun, but I can tell you right now to this very moment that he is not a gun instructor and nowhere near the, (laughs) nowhere near the expert of this, but everyone who has a passion, they all think, that they've, you know, they slept at the Holiday Inn Express last night, so therefore they can perform surgery or whatever it is. And, it's, and football is rampant with that, you know. Yeah. That's how yeah. it is. You got to know yeah. that and live with it. Uh, I got, I got one more question uh, on the on your kind of history. What's what's with the crow, or is it a raven, or is it both? Is it, are you? Because there's some there's some negative connotations that come with it, but there's also like if you go with Greek mythology, there's some some symbols of prophecy and good luck. What, what's the what's the idea behind the crow? 
Yeah, the crow is, and it is a crow. Thank you for for asking to distinguish the either one. But the crow is, it's, you know, there's some of the Native American kind of mythology with it. There's a, a lot of mythology about just one, and some of the just kind of the truisms about the animal that we've learned over the past decade about problem solving, intelligence, about, um, you know, creativity, um, using tools, um, you know, in terms of, also being, you know, in terms of also kind of being scouts in a sense, in terms of the way they look at things. And then there's also even just the humility, you know, eating crow, you know, there's right. a little bit of that too, a little self-deprecating humor. Um, and then there's just also the fact that, um, you know, I've had an ex- I had a, some interesting experiences with, with crows um, that I just decided maybe it was just, let's just adopt the bird as the crow. Uh, let's just adopt the crow as the, uh, as the logo for it. One of them was just before, I think right after I decided to recommit to doing the, you know, staying with this, my wife and I came home one time just after um, we put the book, I put the book out and there was a flock of crows or a murder of crows that were like circling the house. (laughs) And that's, we've only seen one or two, but there were like 30 or 40 of them literally flying around the house in a cert in a very tight circle. That's it. And then for 15 minutes they did that and slowly started to peel off until one just was flying around the house for literally five more minutes and then just flew off. And we just both looked at each other and I was like, yeah, okay. And that was about it. So it's a lot of it has to do with that. Yeah. Big co on, on our Patreon show this week, told the story about hunting crow and how he's he had a really hard time ever trying to hunt crow on his family's farm growing up crow's smart man yes <laughs> <laughs> when you started talking about the intelligence it's like there i did tell a story last week i'll keep it short but they when i tried to go hunting in my up in my great granddaddy's property with there we had a corn patch and the crows would always be up there tearing up our corn sure and uh i couldn't i couldn't get close enough never got close enough because there was always one up in a tree and he was the lookout and so if I got close enough, he would crow, he would caw, 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 and they would all fly off. Yeah. Well, I had to figure it out years later that if he, re- if that lookout, if the crows, the, the, the community lookout, if they said, Hey, you're the one up in the tree that's looking out and he doesn't call and, and alert to trouble. And I get up in there and I start blasting my shotgun off. All the crows that make it out of the fight are going to go whip that other crow's ass. <laughs> that was his job. Yep. And, I, and I didn't know it at the time. I, you know, I was 14, 15 years old, just trying to have a good time. And uh, the, the, uh, the crows are smart. They're hard to hunt. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I've, I've been they watching The Wire people. recently, and they brought up how crows have a sense of humor. And you brought up The Wire earlier. I've been going through that because I'd never seen it before and crushed through season one. And there was some guy talking about how crows are really smart, and they also have a sense of humor. They'll play tricks on each other. So, yeah. love it. They, they There's pictures of – there's film of crows um, literally using tools to, like, sled down um, snowy roofs. <laughs> and and how they recognize people so like they probably recognize Corey's face and saw him coming and knew that he had he didn't have good intentions yeah, for trouble. them yeah <laughs> exactly exactly <Omar's> coming yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly so you know there's a lot of that just kind of that fits in with all of it so and there is that whole idea that it's kind of that they're kind of a malign bird but there's also a lot of underside to it that's more so it's, it's that whole like there's a little something going on deeper than what it looks like yeah. a little bit deeper Good a lot stuff. of layers of the crow love it all right shall all we right. talk some real football let's do it yeah let's uh all, all right, right. We'll crack a fresh one to get into the actual uh football talk so my first question for you is and we we talked to angelo about this a little bit um, and I kind of want to ask everybody a, a couple of the same general questions just because I like to see what other people's opinions are down the line here. My, when you're looking at a prospect, how do you weigh things like the offense that they play in, team success, offensive line play, if it's a running back, the competition that they're facing, and like the other skill players around them? For instance, like, you know, if you have uh, a Clyde Edwards Hilaire who's at LSU and everything's awesome. You know, how do you rate that versus like a Cam Akers where you're at FSU and you can clearly tell that, you know, the level of players around them is just it's just not clicking right now. It's not happening. How how does how do you weigh all those things when you're evaluating a prospect? Yeah, it's such a great question. I'm glad you guys asked it because I wish it would be asked more often. And really, the, the answer is, again, about how you create your process, because conceptually, when you're trying to study a player, you want to make sure that you're isolating 
all the different skills in whether it's athletic, technical, conceptual, or intuitive, all the different types of decision-making and techniques and athletic abilities of that player and isolated as much as possible to different tasks. And if you do that and you keep, and you really magnify it to, to the minutia, the in-depth tasks, then what happens is that regardless of the outcome of that player's, uh, uh, you know, of the, like the yardage outcome or the production outcome of that, that play, Mm-hmm. Um, if you see, if you've isolated it enough, you can see whether that player was successful or not, regardless of how, of whether he was successful success. or not yeah. Yeah, to the play success. And I've learned that over and over again, because, you know, there are guys like I had high grades on Ahmad Bradshaw in a, in a game against Tennessee, where he literally averaged less than a yard per carry. I had a high grade for Matt Forte against an LSU defense that literally could out the entire LSU team could outlift all but one player on Tulane and Matt Forte <laughs> averaged less than three yards per touch on the, in that game. And he earned high marks on my uh, squad. And in a, but in contrast, I've had guys like Bishop Sankey who've like run all over people's yardage wise who didn't make the cut as well in terms of, I had concerns about him because what you learn is that if you're isolating the correct behaviors, then even if they don't have success on the field, you're still able to, you know, you're still able to find out whether that player is doing the things that he needs to do that are projectable to the league. Um, And so, yes, it's nice to be able to say that a player, you know, that a wide receiver was able to win over, you know, a top notch cornerback and to be able to do things on that level. And, and certainly that can be helpful in terms of validating, you know, maybe speed or athletic ability, but I use the analytics for the, for the athletic ability. I lean on that more than anything to, to look at athletic ability and I try and match it to the field, which we can talk a lot about a little bit more later. But yeah, when I look at this stuff, I find that as long as, as long as I'm isolating everything that I need to in terms of processes, then it really doesn't matter who they play or who they who their surrounding talent is um, because they're doing the things that they need to do um, to make good plays, even if they don't happen. All right. Well, I mean, I'm, that all comes back to analytics there, I guess. You know, it all comes back to that that job training of, of breaking all those little tiny details down. There. So it uh, all comes full circle once again. Um, who who was the easiest running back to evaluate in, in your process over this last year? I think Jonathan Taylor. Uh, I think that everything about him was pretty clear cut. Um, very powerful, can move a pile. Um, you know, you see that repeatedly on his tape. You might as well think that he's a furniture mover in terms of the way that he's able to move piles. It's unbelievable what he does there with his balance. So he has that excellent contact, contact balance, terrific movement skills in terms of his his ability to, to make a variety of cuts and footwork adjustments to set up creases and and I know what he does well I mean he's he has certain zone runs that he can perform well he also has certain uh you know he plays in a lot of gap oriented type of um schemes so he's he's strong with there and as good of as he is as a runner and as fast as he is and and all the athletic ability that he has um he's not much of a pass protector he could be but he's he's kind of allergic to it right now um, and so he's, something something like that is that something that really concerns you, or is that a, v- a very learnable trait? Is it more a, about willingness? Is it you know? Is it how does that go? It's it's a combination of things for him because of his size, because of his quickness, and because I've seen him perform well on occasion. Um, to me, it's about effort with him, and I would have to think that you know more often than not, these are young guys, and they tend to mature and begin and get better as pass protectors if they have the skills, the baseline skills to do it. There may be some concerns about diagnosis, um, but from what I've seen, I've seen situations with him where I, I don't necessarily want to accuse him of not wanting to block, but I, I, I have to kind of go there because. Yeah, you kind of do, where, right? In, yeah. in, the, in your breakdown on the on the uh, rookie scouting portfolio, you were kind of calling out his uh, a little bit of yeah. his effort, right? Yeah, it is because you watch him and there's plays. It's like he's right there. And he seems to do what wide receivers do downfield, which is try and make a, a create a situation where it's like, 
oh, I just missed. And anyone watching the film is like, you've got to be kidding me. Like you just did that. You look like you look like the eighth grader who's like trying to get their little brother into the end zone and keep him from crying and giving him the give him the touchdown to run through the field. And everybody's like just missing the guy. That's kind of what he looked like in, in a lot of pass protection exposures where he was, you know, inches away and just moves away like he he's more rushes the outside shoulder of the man coming in yeah you know so he you know i've seen jordan wilkins the the colts running back excellent runner doesn't have that top end athletic ability but he's a terrific runner and he he's a very good pass protector who wanted to be when he was at Ole miss he would do that there was a play he completely whiffed on um i remember watching him in a game where he completely whiffed and then the and then the coach kind of yelled at him. And then the next time he was in the game, they ran that exact same protection scheme. And and he just lit up the guy with exactly the kind of technique you'd want. It was a picture perfect punch with position and everything. And I'm like, that's that's kind of what I see with with Taylor, which is it's it's more of an issue for him where it's the the want to and the consistency. It's it's kind of like the I've joked, it's kind of like the masseuse who doesn't want to come home and give his wife a massage because right. he does it all day long. You know, I'm, I'm a, I, I renovate houses for a living. I've, I don't want to come home and work on my own house. The, the shoes, the cobblers, children, you know, they don't have shoes, you know, those kind of deals. <laughs> that, it's the whole so, deal. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Real quick, yeah, may, must- maybe Jonathan Taylor's just tired, man. He's doing everything. He's like, he's, man, you can have the pass. You can I'm have carrying the pass 10 people on my back. <laughs> yeah. What do you want more from? Yeah. That's exactly what I was about to say. If you feel like a guy like Jonathan Taylor is going to get such amount of work and everybody knows it coming in, he's going to pound the rock and you got to stop him. And Wisconsin's got the history. I feel like once he gets into the NFL and he's got a paycheck, it, that, you know, he doesn't. He's. I think that can be the next check mark on his list. Yeah, because he's a, a super high character guy. I mean, he when he when he's done with football, super he high want, intelligence. He wants to yeah. go to Harvard and study astrophysics. That's what his like after football kind of mentality is. So maybe it was a little bit of some business decisions, toting the rock so many times. Maybe trying to avoid some extra contact. Not, and that's perfectly possible. I mean, I I've talked about that with a guy about like Isaiah Crowell back in the day who was a Georgia back, who was a five-star recruit, and then went to, what, Alabama State? Yeah. And, and at Alabama State, Reggie Barlow, former running back um, or kick returner for the Jaguars, who was their coach, called him out in the media and said, you know, there were times he took him out himself outside of games and didn't really do all the things he needed to do. And I gave him a pass because I was like, okay, you you basically got kicked out of Georgia. You could have been a top, you know, you could have been a top running back in terms of draft pick you would have had great draft capital and now you're at alabama state and you know that you've got to be healthy for the combine right or else no one you know you're not gonna have a shot to even be drafted some self-preservation that was all it was and i thought you know the the college game you know i'm a big pro fan college is to me serves a purpose for me which is just to review and i understand that a lot of people love college football but to me you know when it comes down to it the guys well, who know they have these a shot people in the league. south know that though, Matt. You got to yeah. you got to keep up the image of yeah of loving college football. You you do, but I'm I'm probably one of those people that doesn't really do that. I I yeah. pretty much say it serves a purpose, and that's all it is. And I think that at some point, you know, the, the co- what the college game demands of a player can be more than what necessarily either is necessarily fair or may not make the most sense for that player who may actually decide to go pro. Especially running backs. Especially running backs. All right. Well, um, well, I didn't even know what Saturdays were for for a long time because I grew up in the Northeast and college football is, you know, hardly a thing. I moved down south 15 years ago and it's like, you better get on board. So, (laughs) uh, but it's a lot of fun. Saturdays at the game, there's there's not much, not much better than that. Um, Well, so we have Taylor as our number one back. We kind of have him in a tier above everybody else. Uh, we, We think that he's kind of, one of those guys, if you put him in a rookie draft like next year, he's, he has a chance, in our opinion, to be, you know, a, a first round pick. I think we think that much of him that he could. He's already kind of a second, third round startup pick in a brand new startup dynasty draft. Um, we, we think that much of him. But he has I guess the main thing is that the fumbling problem is that is that something that is an issue to you? Is that a fixable problem? We mentioned that he's a really smart guy. I, fi- I find it hard to believe that somebody with his aptitude is is not able to fix 
problems like that. But in, in your uh, opinion, how do how do things like that usually pan out? Yeah. And, and it's a good, I would argue that brains has nothing to do with it because it's, because the thing about football is that it's a performance Avenue and any type of performance industry, you can be wicked smart, but when you're on that stage, there are certain things that just take over that, that are hard sometimes to correct. And part of that is feeling pressure. Part of that is putting pressure on yourself. Um, you know, having intelligence and having the maturity or wisdom or the emotional intelligence to to know how to block things out. Sometimes that takes time, you know, because you can get even the smartest people for sure, because they get in their own head and right. overthink things. And then that neurosis comes in into, into effect. So for him, it's it's about pass protection and running and uh, and being able to take care of the football. It, they are both correctable. Um, the, the hard part about um, correcting the football is that if if he overthinks it and he gets too much in his head, then he can lose confidence because he may fumble more, and then the team loses confidence in him, and then he loses opportunities um, as a result of that. We saw that with Stevon Ridley. We've seen that with a number of guys, but we've also seen recently Sony Michelle and Miles um, Sanders, who also right. had awful ball security issues, be able to um, really do a pretty good job of that for their first year. So yeah, yeah Alvin I, Cook is another one. I guess you could maybe throw in. Yeah. There. Tiki That's Barber a, a long time ago cleaned it up. Um, AP. Yeah, absolutely. Fumbled. And AP fumbled 20 times in his first two years, I think. Be, for Jonathan Taylor, you did see, I think, I believe it was nine fumbles in the freshman year and then split the difference on the 18 total on, on the next two years. So he did clean it up a little bit, I believe, from one, from one year to the, to the previous two years. But, I mean, still splitting nine between two years is still a lot. Yeah, uh, he but, still had his his – his rate per fumbles was still so was still every year, even if you're just looking year by year, was still well below what was even committee tier for my for my expectations of how I rate. So as a result of that, he has to prove that he has to hold on the ball for me. And and I think he can, but I can't give him, you know, I can't give him the extra points that separate him from my number one running back just because I think he can do it. I have to I can say I'm projecting some improvement and here's some points for that, but I'm not giving him double super secret points to give him on top of over the guy, even if I think that it's possible, you know, it's fair. All right. That's fair. Yeah. All right. So let's go to the opposite side of that. The running back, you struggled most with the evaluation. Yeah. It was Deandre Swift out of Georgia. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that when you watch his game, he looks quicker than fast, but then he runs a 40 time. That's faster than his 20 shuttle, which is more, you would expect the 20 shuttle to be faster than a 40 if he's quicker than fast. Then you see this really extraordinarily nice footwork in terms of his ability to make people miss with different kinds of movement. Um, you know, the the quick change of directions. There you go. Movement. Got, see, there we go. <laughs> he's got that little like uh, that like dead leg uh juke yeah, that is, is he just kills people with that thing. Yeah, the give a leg, take a leg type of deal, the the different pressure cuts that he has those are very good and he's and he's the type of guy also that when you look at his he's a strong guy who can drag defenders and if he gets hit from the side by say defensive linemen and linebackers he can carry them a little bit but he's not going to win in head-on collisions and then he's also so when you look at all of that you start looking at his combine times versus what he does on the field you kind of you have to sort that out and i and one of the things that i've learned especially with dalvin cook was that Sometimes the combine exercise doesn't match the style of how the player plays. Everyone was freaked out about the vertical jump and the three cone drill for Dalvin Cook. But when you watch him, he has that movement to be able to bend around the corner. Here it comes, that curvy linear movement to be able to work around the corner and and do well, that at a high rate of speed. And that's something that Dal that DeAndre Swift also has. And as a result of that, when you look at the three cone drill, the way they move in that in that sense doesn't mean dropping the hips and bending the knees deeply to make those cuts. So why are you going to apply that? It's kind of like if you're a house renovator and you're working on wainscoting for for you know uh, you know for a craftsman home, you're not going to put Baroque wainscoting in there, you know, when it calls for when it calls for you know the 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 craftsman style or a mission right. style or what, or the Japanese craftsman style or whatever you do. And it's, 
And it's the same kind of thing. Like his game doesn't match the exercise. So you don't want to apply the exercise and penalize the guy too much. So it took some time to look at it and realize that. And what I also saw was that Swift was the type of guy that after I had to go back and look over and over again, is that he may, he has good initial burst for sure, but he's not going to be doing it out of jump cuts or, you know, jump stops. It's going to be more about just immediately turning and running. And that acceleration is very strong. But his build-up speed is also very good. Once he gets to that top speed, he just needs a longer runway to do it. But if he can get past 40 yards, then he's gone because his he sustains his top he's, speed. He's wound up and going. Yeah. And that's what, you, you know, Marshawn Lynch was had a good 40 time, but we found over the years what he really was was a guy that could – sustain his speed even after hits or changing direction and crisscrossing the field. And that's what made his speed special is that he could sustain the pace and wear defenders out and pursuing him. And Swift's a little like that in terms of his speed. He just doesn't have what Marshawn Lynch brings to the table in terms of power and balance to actually make that happen on a regular basis. But if he gets past 50 yards, he, he's not going to get run down very often. Yeah, well, I had a, a question about Swift that I was that I was thinking about was like a, a player like him who came in and was so highly thought of as a freshman at UGA. Like when uh, Chubb and um, Michelle. You know, Sony Michelle were there, it was oh wait till Swift's gonna he's he's the guy. And like if you're into Devi, like he was a high Devi guy and a guy like Cam Akers too, high Devi guy. Do you think? And it's surprising to I think a lot of people when maybe you don't have Swift as the top guy because for so long he was touted just. Do you, do you think that plays into the public's opinion of like, well, well he's got to be this good. And now you're saying it was a tough evaluation and maybe he's not, isn't, he was good, but maybe he's not quite as good as everybody thought he was at the end of the day. Do you, do you see, does that play into anybody into your opinion or to the public's opinion? Oh, I think it definitely adds into the bias of a situation because he was touted as a, as a, as, a, as an excellent player in Georgia. When you look at what they, they had with, Todd Gurley, Keith Marshall, Sony Michelle, Nick Chubb, and you bring all those guys, you know, in in a row, and you kind of have uh, the southeastern version of running back you, um, you know, the southeastern department of that going on at Georgia. Then you have a situation where people are expecting DeAndre Swift to be as good, if not better, and and especially what happens is that the the upside of Debbie is getting to identify players early, but the downside of it is that young players who are often touted as four and five star recruits are often just guys who grew early. They develop their man bodies early. They're, they're faster than anybody else on the field. It's like the kid in high school um, who, you know, they, they get in their eighth grade and they're already five eleven and 175 pounds. They're shaving and, in the seventh grade. Yes, exactly. And everybody's like, wow, you know, he's going to be great in basketball. He's going to be great in football. And then two years later, everyone's caught up with him and they're even taller than he is. And he hasn't grown a lick. Yeah. You know? And that's kind of what happens with a lot of these four and five star guys is that, you know, they can be very good football players. And then they have that man weight and man size um, and athletic ability but then everyone catches up and, and exceeds them and they don't grow as fast. And that's kind of what I think happened a little bit with Swift, not dramatically, but a little bit. And he's also kind of a player that fits certain schemes more than he is scheme independent. And so as a result of that, he reminds me of a guy like D'Angelo Williams, who I think, you know, you put him on the Steelers at the end of the career, he crush could play. It. He was, yeah, crush it. Put him in Carolina early in his career, crushed it, you know, but at the same time, their teams may look at him and go, you know, we'd rather pair him with a big back like Jonathan Stewart. And then his career was kind of like not what it could have been statistically. Right. All right. I've never heard that man, that that grew faster five star th- recruit thing. That's the first time anybody's ever laid it out like that. And it, you can, it, that makes sense. Yeah. Craig Lumpkin was a Georgia back who yeah. was a parade all American who was like, he came in 5'10, 215, rock solid, all of that. And he was a five-star recruit and he had a, you know, he had a cup of coffee with the Packers and didn't look too, too bad, but he was slow. Yeah. And it was because that was his speed when he came up. He was fast for a second and then he wasn't so fast once everybody caught up. <laughs> um, so, uh, next question is uh, we we're really big on Clyde Edwards. I think 
you know, the fantasy community is either really high or some people are just like, I don't get it. And reading the RSP, we saw that you had a, a couple of guys ranked ahead of him that maybe some other people wouldn't quite have a, ahead of him. What, what was your process and thoughts behind that? Yeah. Um, the big thing too, is that I'm a big proponent of tiers more than I am about binary rankings. So to me, we like, hate rankings as well. Yeah. Yeah. My, my chapter says why rankings suck, but we have to do them anyway. You know, and I, <laughs> I, sho- I try and shove that down everybody's throats because I, if I have to do them, I, I want you to know I can't stand them. <laughs> but why do you have Clyde Edwards rank so lower than these other guys? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, and it's more to me about the final score and the score for Clyde Edwards Hilaire for me is a, is a contributing starter or a rotation. I think it's, I always get con- the two tier titles I have confused, but it's a, I believe it's a, a rotational starter and a rotational starter is a guy who's going to be on the field. He's going to get an opportunity to play r- routinely. Um, and he's, and he's someone that if you put him in the right system, where you tailor it to his strengths as a receiver and and certain zone schemes, and he has the talent around him to where, um, you, you know, he doesn't have to work extra hard to try and get every yard. I think he's the type of guy that could be very productive in the league right away. Um, but there are also guys that just happen to grade out a little bit higher, and it was the difference of maybe a combination of two different scores, you know, different – criteria grades that gave them a little bit of a higher grade than what Clyde Edwards Hilaire got. And, and so for me, he's in that second tier of backs um, that, that I would look on the board. So if he's in tier two and you have, you know, five or six players in tier two and your tier one is, you know, for me is probably, you know, JK Dobbins and, and, and Jonathan Taylor, then, then any, you know, if you like Edwards Hilaire more I, I'm not going to argue with you about taking him, even if I have him, you know, sixth or seventh compared to the guy I have third or fourth, because it's that close. And it just depends all it's going to depend on fit with the team more than anything. I think, I think that's pretty fair. So it, I have a question. If, if you're, if you're in a rookie draft, I'm assuming you play dynasty football, right? Right. This pretty much that's most of the stuff right. I do these days. Uh, how could, how could you not? Um, right. So if, 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 you weigh the tiers more so than the rankings per se, and you're in a PPR league. Would that bump Clyde Edwards up above maybe another guy that you have, you know, ranked over him uh, because of the the catch passing, pass catching ability? It might if it's um, depends on the team. You know, for instance, you know, I like AJ Dillon, and I think he's rated. I have him rated over Clyde Edwards Hilaire right now. If AJ Dillon goes to a team where it's mostly he's going to mostly run the ball I think and he's not going to be as much he's not going to get a, as many checkdowns and the run the run game there doesn't have a really strong offensive line but Edwards goes to a Edwards Hilaire goes to a team that where he's going to get a, a lot of passes thrown his way say he goes to New England they just decide for whatever reason you know, well, maybe not New England or the Chiefs. He goes, maybe they goes he, to the Chiefs. He goes to the Chiefs, or he goes he goes to the Buccaneers. Tampa Bay, yeah. And yeah. Tom Brady makes him his James White plus type of player. Plus, yeah, of plus. course, yeah, exactly. Then I'm gonna <laughs> then I'm gonna absolutely take Clyde Edwards Hilaire higher than where I would you know take AJ Dillon. But if AJ Dillon's going to the Baltimore Ravens, and right. there and you know that Mark Ingram is like saying goodbye, you know they're he's, gonna say goodbye. He's moonlight and he's twilight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or he goes to the Titans and they just franchise the big guy, but he could walk next year because they don't want to give him all the money and they bring in, he's right behind him, Derrick Henry, you know? Yeah, Which exactly. That's is, perfect. Then, yeah, it's like, you know, blow that truck horn and get ready to go because that's what's <laughs> going to happen with, you know, with Dylan. I'll wait a year on that. Yeah. Well, I, I think appreciate that's. The, I'm sorry, ahead. Kate. I appreciate no, that scheme fit means something to you because scheme fit means a lot to Casey and I and Jay and myself. Like we, I like the part where you the RSP is football first, and then you put a fantasy spin on it. Obviously, we're a fantasy football podcast, but we like to talk football. And then we turn we we talk trades, we talk rookie drafts, we talk we talk fantasy football, but we're going to talk football first and foremost. And all that the scheme fit comes into play. You take a player like AJ Dillon, and you put him. Baltimore Ravens is perfect. I was thinking Titans, but you put him in one of those systems. You know, a guy that's made to carry the ball is about to carry the ball. Yeah. Or if he goes somewhere else where you're like, Oh, this play that there's bad franchises and they, they just, you don't know why this team even picked that player. They don't do that. 
This yeah. offense doesn't run the ball like that, and they picked that player. You don't know why they did that. You know, yeah. Put Corey Dillon side saddle of Deshaun Watson in Houston's offense, and I'm like, <laughs> I, I'll easily take Clyde edwards helaire anywhere else. All right, you know? we're moving Clyde up the board. I feel like, do you, yes. Do you feel like that you can? And as far as maybe fantasy, or I guess you could apply it in regular football. Do you feel like you could uh, maybe overrate landing spots sometimes? Like you know, everyone was upset that. AJ Brown landed in Tennessee and then, you know, you see it kind of quickly turn around Chubb and in the Browns, you see it kind of quickly turn around. Can you get maybe a little too caught up in that sometimes? Or or how do you feel about that? You absolutely can. And those are good examples of that worked out for me because I actually had Brown as my, as I said, I, I wrote last year that he was a great fit in Tennessee, despite what anybody had to say and, and explained why um, because of the slot factor and the fact that, Mariota and both Tannehill shared um, the slot receiver that they slot love that that they both had who <laughs> had his one of his most productive careers and I can't remember his name he's out of the league now but he played in Miami and Tennessee and had his best years with both those guys for like a two three year span and I'm thinking how do you not how are you not going to love the fact that he plays inside and he's going to get a lot of these looks and he'll get inside and outside opportunities but Rashard right. Matthews. Matthews, Richard Jordan. Matthews. Yeah, yeah. For sure. That was Matthews. it. Richard oh, Matthews. Cool. Thank you. Hot and heavy on that guy for a while. Yeah. 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 But I mean, again, you know, this was to, to me that makes sense. But again, it is. If you can get you can get enamored too much with a, a certain fit. And part of that does have to come down to whether or not it's just because he enters the the team as a starter. Like people may look at it and say, oh man, David Montgomery has a clear track to become a starter for the Bears. And that's great. Well, if, you know, as the season goes on and you see that the offensive line isn't healthy. It's terrible and, and Mitchell that Trubisky, doesn't process well. Yeah, then it's, then it's not good. Or if Miles Sanders, if, you know, Miles Sanders was more if of a gap runner. <laughs> If they're extinct with running backs at the end of the year, Miles Sanders is going to get every opportunity plus good coaching. Like you yeah. got Peterson and you have a great running backs coach there. I mean, you can't put, you know, I don't think enough people look at things like that either. Yeah. And he got better, you know, yeah, he, he, he got did. better for sure. But at the beginning of the year, he couldn't run, he couldn't run zone scheme. And so they had to, they had to implement gap for him. And we called him an athlete playing the running back position who never had to learn how to play the running back See, position because he was kind of yeah. out at like, Kind of like maybe he was the seventh grader who was shaven early. He never he was always the best yeah. athlete, so he maybe never had to yeah. learn some of the nuances. But he definitely grew as a runner. Yeah, um, yeah. Tevin Coleman was that way in Atlanta. I got criticized. I remember because I said Tevin Coleman wasn't a very good outside zone runner, and I remember somebody was saying. I heard somebody somebody told me secondhand that someone was criticizing that take because he ran outside zone at Indiana, and I'm like, yeah, but running outside zone at Indiana. And having two successful runs against Ohio State for 150 yards while you had another 15 that weren't any good wasn't going to project well for the NFL for you. And it's going to take him some time. And they actually implemented gap plays that first year in Atlanta for him in Mike Shanahan's, Kyle Shanahan's offense. Kyle Shanahan went, I mean, now he's running gap and all sorts of stuff now. But sure, right. he, at the time, it was just outside zone. And and it took, it took Coleman two to three years to really become – a better um, zone runner, and and now he's competent at it at the very least. All yeah, right. if he could just stay healthy, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we talked about you talked about Dylan a little bit there. That leads into the next question of when running backs have a high odometer, a lot of carries on their on their um, low, resume. There, we trend. got eight hundred eight hundred and forty five carries for a guy like Dylan. We already talked about Jonathan Taylor, who had nine hundred and some odd carries in his career. Is that something that concerns you for a running back moving forward? Not a lick if they stay healthy. Not if they have, not if they have the um, medical reports to show that they they don't have any chronic injury issues. They don't have anything that's debilitating. They haven't had surgery after surgery. Nothing's connected on that level. Then what that shows me is that he's proven he can carry the ball a lot and then stay healthy. And and while that there's no true, you know correlation between that and i've looked you know i mean i've looked through you know years of of players who've led the ncaa and carries at least one year and half of them over the past 15 years made the pro bowl you know nice. they're guys like steven jackson um you know michael the burner turner adrian peterson 
um, you know, Ray Rice, guys like that. Cedric Benson maybe wasn't a Pro Bowl player, but he was good. Certainly was a you know he was a decent player in the NFL. Even guys like Bobby Rainey, who were just career backups, but you could put him in the lineup, and he was a small guy who performed just fine. So, and then what I found is that if I look deeper and just look at guys who had a certain at least a certain number of touches, like I think seven hundred attempts in a season at least, um, what I found is that they at least av- that I would say. I don't remember what the percentage was, but a high percentage of them averaged at least like, I want to say something like almost 800 yards and a certain number of touchdowns and were, were competent players at the very least. And so to me, it is, it's just, it's, it's a myth. It's just a worrisome myth. If the guy's healthy and he's, and he's getting a lot of touches, you know, do you do that at war? I mean, I just don't, you know, do we do, I mean, I know that it's a physical game and people can yeah. get hurt, but you can't protect injuries, but you can kind of say the the guy knows how to, to, to stay healthy. He knows how to protect. He himself. knows how to take contact and, and Dish protect it himself. Like you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Right. And if he didn't have a bunch of carries, he'd be mad that he didn't have a bunch of work that, that you could look yeah, at, you know? So exactly. it's he must not be that good because he, right. he wasn't used enough. And and just for the listeners out there, everything that, that Matt's telling us right now is is in his uh, rookie scouting portfolio, and it's all documented out there. And you, you can there's just tons of information. So I wanted to give it another plug, uh, Matt Waldman, RSP dot com. Um, but let's 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 keep with talking about here AJ Dillon. Um, Case, I know yeah, you, you got, mentioned you mentioned that you had Clyde Edwards and Dillon, you know, uh, ranked ahead of him currently. What is it that you like? Because a lot of people in the dynasty community, when they they're putting out avoid tweets and it's a, avoid AJ Dillon, you don't want AJ Dillon in fantasy, which I I don't agree with. I think he's got fantastic vision, sweet feet. I think he floats and kind of picks and slides his way through that offensive line. Um, I think that they're like, oh well, he's not powerful enough, and blah 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 blah. And I'm like, well, if he was just your traditional power back when he was 250 and, and the size and he just ran right up to the line, you guys would be complaining that that's all he does. He, just, he doesn't do anything else. He just big and fat. He just runs into the back of the people and has no vision. But I think he's so much more than that. He knows how to use the power when he has it. And if you say he doesn't have any power, I don't think you're watching the same thing that I'm watching because he's just thwarting off guys when he's moving. You're not coming from the side of him at all. Like I, I, I really have been enjoying watching the A.J. Dillon tape. And so what... Why, why is he, why do you think people are saying avoid him and why are you so high on him? Well, for many of the reasons you just stated so well, you know, about what he does, those are, those are the main thrusts of it. He is a nimble player. He has a number of different nice moves. He doesn't just rely on one move though. He has a really sweet spin move. He's someone that can also, like you said, pick and slide, be able to make cuts. He knows when to bounce plays outside. He has good vision. He makes good decisions with the blocking scheme that he has, whether it's gap or zone. He knows how to be patient. He knows the, the balance between having a sense of urgency to hit a crease hard and when to actually press a crease and be patient and find the cutback lane. He's difficult in the open field because of the fact that he can make the second man miss and the third man miss. And he has enough burst and speed at his size that he's going to generate enough momentum that he is tough to tackle. Even up front, he's tough to tackle even before he generates that that runway down downhill he's a very good blocker he's 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 not you know maybe nfl ready to take on defensive ends on a regular basis and hold them off just for a minimal amount of time but he has the potential to do so he's not far away um so he picks up a lot of blitzes he moves pretty quickly in that regard he's going to catch catch check downs and everything that you stated about how people seem to characterize him has been applied to derrick henry you know, it's the same. It's the same application. It was applied to James Conner. It was applied to Legarrette Blunt. It was, you know, you and the people they get it wrong. But see, then when you pick a player like Andre Williams, it wasn't applied to Andre Williams because somehow I think he he had a fast time somewhere, and I guess they decided that, you know, it's to them. It's it, oftentimes it's about surface level things, and and people oftentimes don't really understand what power really is. They don't understand what contact balance really is. And it's easy to, they, they see the highlights and they think of the flashy plays and you'll even see them often talk about smaller players and say, you know, look at the power that he has. And what's really happening is that he's 
in a pile and he's getting pushed by two guards five yards downfield. <laughs> and they, they were like, see, he's got power. He's got just as much power as AJ Dillon. He has even more power than AJ Dillon. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, no, he's got Andrew Thomas and Isaiah Peters, you know, pushing, pushing, you know, DeAndre Swift seven yards because he kept his feet, which is good, but still, you know, AJ Dillon, if he were in that situation, they might, they might have like completely pushed it all the way down, you know, <laughs> you know, down <laughs> to the end the field. That right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I mean, that's, I just, it's going to be interesting because we have uh Ray GQ on next week when he's a big Debbie guy. He does writing for DLF. I'm not, I'm not sure if you know who he is or I not. I do. Um, yeah. But he's, he's a, he's an anti Dylan guy. So it'll be fun to, to, uh, put him put him in the put his hold his feet to the fire there and, and say what's your problem man <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure he'll give a good argument you know and and you know he does good work and and certainly someone who is who works hard through you know in this so it's going to be interesting to see how he how you know how he responds to that and, and yeah what his thoughts are yeah all right um well let's get into into your your number one back as you alluded to earlier jk dobbins um we have him as our second guy r- right after taylor there um, I guess my first question for Dobbins is, and, and you could, I'd love to hear what you have your thoughts on him, but he had his best year this year. Obviously there's a good offensive line in play at, at Ohio state. Most years this year was pretty decent. Uh, did a good job of rotating guys around. And then they add Justin Fields. Who's obviously a huge runner. Is it a coincidence that, that Dobbins had his best year and you put a running quarterback in that backfield with him or did Dobbins just get that much better and from one year or did he, did he basically just continuously get better? And, and this is just JK Dobbins. Is there, is did fields attribute to his success this year at all? When you look at the numbers statistically attributed to it for sure. Um, I think from the standpoint of whether it was, he always good. I think he was always good. I just think that Ohio state does what a lot of top programs do, which is when they recruit, they say, listen, you, if you're a top recruit, you're going to get on the field. You're going to have a role because we realize that we don't want to um, recruit top guys and then have them sit for two, three years because they're more liable to transfer somewhere else at this point. And they realize that. So they, they give rotations. And that's what creates misunderstandings about players. Like Sony Michelle is the pass receiver. Nick Chubb can't catch. You know, Nick Chubb can't run outside. Sony Michelle's the outside runner. Um, right. But when it was really more of a role than it was what they can do or can't do. And it's the same thing with, I think, Ohio State. While Mike Weber really didn't, you know, really wasn't a top prospect for the NFL, he was a top, sp- top prospect coming out of high school. And so I think that they felt good enough about him. And then they had Master Teague and now they have – you know, they have like Dobbins, the guy from Oklahoma, guy transferring from Oklahoma. coming in this year. Yeah. So sermons coming there. I, I think so. Oh, wow. Okay. Is that, is that right? I thought I saw somebody transfer into. Yeah. I know he transferred Ohio somewhere, State. but I didn't know if that was it, but that's, that'd be interesting if he is. But the, but you know, when you look at Dobbins, I watched a lot of him last year, you know, in 2018 and was very impressed with his skills. The TCU game against 28 in 2018, great footwork, really good skill of being able to, you know, peripherally see on the periphery defenders penetrating understanding how to get back into the um you know behind his blockers and get the most out of a play he wasn't there he has some issues sometimes where a bounce plays outside i joke around it's like going to the corner store where it's you know they they rely too much on their athletic ability and they get sucked into the goodies that are that are at the <laughs> corner store but they're not good for you you know right um and oftentimes in the nfl it's not very good for you to hit the corner, <laughs> corner store um so he might have some of that to contend with but he he has enough speed and enough burst that i think you're going to find that he he's going to win more of those than you might realize um, because of because of that high end athletic ability, I don't think people like the fact that he's 209 pounds. They consider you know big backs. They like the 215 to 225, 230 pound guys the most. Um, but he's well built. He's strong. He has terrific stiff arm. Um, you know, both as a, a device to ward off people, but also push them to the ground. Um, he understands how to use leverage. He's a good receiver and. He's yeah. someone that is just big play and his combination of feet to like really like so find solutions um, in a very efficient manner, I thought was the best in this class in terms of how he used his footwork and balance. So I, I really, the, the, the decision-making issues were more maturity as opposed to not understanding the scheme. And so he reminds me of kind of a mix of Ray Rice 
and Ladanian Tomlinson. Um, more rice than <laughs> Sign Tomlinson. me up. Yeah. And so, I mean, he may never hit those heights, but I think that he will be, I think he'll be closer to Ray Rice's type of career behind a good scheme. And and to me, he was the safest runner in this class With in, when you think about the combination of his upside and athletic ability, conceptual skill, and that he was just a slight, you know, he was a little better blocker than, 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 um, Taylor, Taylor and he had better ball security than Taylor. And that was really the only difference between those two. Taylor is the better runner. I'm not, uh, I won't even, you know, if you're just going to talk about handing the ball off, Jonathan Taylor is the best guy in this class. If you're going to talk about being a running back and what it means to be a running back. JK Dobbins got a slight edge on him. Yeah. I think I like, I like Dobbins, his hands. I don't, he, he doesn't have any, he's not like Clyde Edwards Hilaire in the, in the, route running ability, but like everything he just those subtle things that running backs are supposed to be able to do. He's really good. I thought he had good hands. My, uh, my quick, very s- small summary of Dobbins was subtly sudden was kind of like just how I viewed him. It, yeah. I just felt like time after time, he just, he didn't do a whole lot of dancing. It was quick, decisive things and he was gone and the acceleration's good and the speed's good enough. I know he didn't run the combine, and some people are like, well, "Why didn't he run the combine?" And I, because he had Angela Clemson's on. secondary, like, <laughs> right. they were, you know, on yeah. a bum ankle, and he had a yeah. right, and he had a bad ankle. Like, I, I, I didn't know too much about him coming into that game. I'm a, I'm a Clemson alumni, so I'm heavily invested there, and and just watching what he did to Clemson that whole game, like, it was just unbelievable. I was like, man, this cat is good, and he's hurt. Like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah by. My colleague at the rookie scouting portfolio, Mark Schofield, who is a former Wesleyan quarterback and who does mostly quarterback work, but also writes now at a, um, USA Today, Wire under Doug Farrar. Um, and he's doing some, you know, expanding his repertoire. We, were, we did a show this week on my on my podcast, and I'm going to start calling it putting down the pen moment because he said that it was, you know, he watched there are certain plays you just watch and you put the pen down and say, that's all I need to see. Right. And. And when you see him outrun some of those Clemson workout warriors, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, just that they're fast, and he's out able to outrun those guys on a bum ankle, you put the pen down and say, I'm done. I yeah. like it. That's all I needed That's to it. see. Yep. All right. <laughs> Hated it, I mean, but they, loved it. Clemson better be glad he got an ankle injury. They might have not even made it to the championship game. <laughs> um, all right. Let's. right. Who's the last guy? Oh, Antonio Gibson was the last player I wanted to talk about um i know he's different than all the rest of these guys that we talked about he's a little di- tier below these guys but i think he's super interesting he's so much fun to watch and i missed on a guy like tony pollard last year i oh, thought he was too. more of a, a receiver who could play some running back but definitely wasn't the backup to zeke and but i thought he looked really good given the opportunities that he did when zeke was out and in the preseason um and in my opinion he's one of the handcuffs you gotta own if you own zeke um and Pollard had 78 carries, 39 receptions his last season in Memphis. Gibson had 33 attempts and 38 receptions, but averaged 19.3 a reception and 11.2 a carry whilst scoring 12 touchdowns. Like this guy was just a threat to score every time he touched it. What are, what are your thoughts on a guy like that? Am I am I just making up for my miss of Pollard in, in my love for Antonio Gibson right now? And he is pretty cheap in Dynasty still, but is my love affair warranted? What's your thoughts on a guy like Gibson? No, I think it can be warranted. I think the the problem for evaluators, especially someone like myself, is that you, I'm probably always going to miss on guys like Tony Pollard and Antonio Gibson and always be a little too low on them because there's just not enough of a sample size with carries to really see the full expression of their talents. And when you're trying to when you're trying to scout, especially the way I do, it's not for one specific team. So I have to look at the variety of skills that the running back position can have. And sometimes I'm not going to see him run zone or I'm not going to see him in certain situations with certain types of contact balance that he's just not going to face because he didn't have his not enough carries for me to see it. Maybe he only ran a certain number of routes. So I love his talent. Like when you just talk about what he seems capable of being able to become, high upside. Um, love the all around skills. Lo- there's some things he can do as a receiver, like run curl routes and run and make plays over the middle of the field, like a, like a slot receiver that you've got to feel really good about. Um, and then as a runner, terrific contact balance, someone with excellent speed and acceleration, someone who can catch the ball deep. I, you know, I had a, a reader of mine who's, I think he's an astute 
as an astute eye for running back play. And he often comes with kind of outside the box um, comparisons. His name's Eric Mack. I think he lives in Baltimore as well. And Eric, Eric said to me, he goes, you know, Antonio Gibson reminds me of Eric Metcalf. If you remember Eric Metcalf from like the throwback Falcons and yeah. Yeah. And I said, you know, even at two 30, he's like, yeah, he's like, what is what is it that he can't do that Metcalf does, but with more power. And mm-hmm. I thought, well, I mean, that's an interesting comp. Um, and I don't know if I fully agree with that. Cause I remember watching Eric Metcalf a good bit, but, uh, I don't think he's as light footed as that, but he is a dynamic athlete and there's so much that he can do that the yeah. team's going to be able to get a lot out of him. And I think there's a lot of growth potential for him for sure. For it's that it's the dynasty that there's just, I think there's so much top end uh, potential there that I've, he's just got me super intrigued. Is there like a landing spot that would make, make, make you feel better about it? I know certain coaches are better at bringing people along and have a better eye for guys who fit right into their system. I think Shanahan's been doing a good job of that in, in San Francisco outside of Pettis, which I think that might be more on Pettis than Shanahan. It um, is. Yeah. But is, is there a system or a, a landing spot that, that would make you feel good about Gibson? Or- yeah, I think so. I, you know, obviously, I mean, an easy answer is new Orleans. Um, Always. Just because yeah, they're imaginative. <laughs> exactly. Fuck big coast heartstrings. Yeah. Dome. You put you you put Sean Payton calling out any player that he really wants, and that's my yeah. guy. Yeah, Andy Reid obviously is an imaginative guy. He can make that work. Um, I also think that there's a possibility there. I don't think they're going to do it. I don't think they need it. But certainly the Colts would be an interesting um, uh, possibility for him because he could, he could get early playing time in a gap scheme that's pretty heavy there. That wouldn't be bad. Um, I think that, you know, those are probably the teams that make the most sense to me right off the bat. Um, Teams that sound like it would be a good idea, but I don't know if they could implement it. The Rams just seems like every year they, they talk about wanting to have a guy like that. Washington seems like they talk about having a guy like that. Doesn't really happen. Um, The Eagles, just because they already, I could see how they would platoon maybe a little bit. And they have the the brain trust to probably do it, but you know it's kind of like Dallas Goddard right now, where you're kind of like stuck you know, in you purgatory. You see the talent, but he's stuck in purgatory. I kind of fear that that's what would happen in that scenario. Um, so those are, you, those are examples. Are you treating him like a running back? I think he had more catches last year than than attempts. I, I don't know what like the, I watched an interview with him, and they were asking him about Tony Pollard, and he was like. He's more of like a running back. I, I think I think he said that he considers himself more of like a wide receiver. Does that how, does that weigh in? Like, are you are you considering him a running back? What do you think he should play? What well, was funny before the before the uh, Senior Bowl, my main you know analysis of him that I put on my site was more from the wide receiver perspective, and I thought he'd make a better wide receiver. Then I graded him as a running back, and I thought he actually has more potential as a running back. Um, and now, of course, he sees himself as a receiver. So it's going to be fascinating <laughs> to see where that is. You just got—that's the hard part about evaluating these guys with low touch attempts—is that yeah. you, you're probably doomed to be wrong in one way or the other. So sure. I'm 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 probably going to have to like put an advisory or talk about that maybe in the next year because as you were bringing it up, I was thinking that's probably the the issue because I remember watching Tony Bollard in the senior bowl and really being impressed with how he ran the football in practice. But again, the practice tape, even when you get the practice tape and can watch it and you're not just at the practice watching it live and you're reviewing it, even then there's things about practice tapes. Practice. Yeah, you don't get a chance to really understand the nuance and the immediacy of how these guys think and process information. Do you get because all they the, know it's practice? Yeah. Do you get all the? Do you get the all twenty twos for all these college guys? No, I don't. Um, and but I do get some, and and I get some access on that level. But I, I don't. And it's something that that's. I always find that kind of interesting too, because I always used to hear. I mean, I interviewed Greg Cosell, um, and he's great, you know. And I interviewed him for about four hours one day about ten years ago. And I did, I did an interview for him and put it on my site. But he always kind of had the shtick at the time where it was like, if you don't have the all 22, then you're not really getting to see the game in its entirety. And I agree with that to an extent. Um, but here's the thing. You got to remember, who was the only person in the, in the industry who had all 22 tape at that time before they released it on NFL.com? Um, Greg Cosell. 
So of <laughs> course that's going to be a thing that you're going to play up. And what I would argue, and I, and I've had this discussion with them before and it's kind of like, you know, the all 22 doesn't really give you good close-ups in the way broadcast film can yeah. with certain types of movement, with certain types of, um, yeah, there you go, with certain types <laughs> of release skills at the line of scrimmage um, and, and press release type of footwork, hand position and hand usage when it comes to the catch point. And yeah. so those are, those are details that are very important to the individual player. And as, and the other thing that I've kind of learned over the years is that, you know, it's wonderful to understand schemes, you know, cut, you know, cover two versus cover one or pattern matching, or, you know, the different types of defensive coverages and offensive plays and whether you understand the difference between a Yankee concept and a Hoss concept and, <laughs> and, you know, all these types of things, but for quarterbacks, for instance, Really, it comes down to whether they're reading leverage well or not against the defender. If they're, you know, you can understand, you can start to pick out what the the progression is and see whether they're following that progression and having an idea of what the what the play is is important and what the coverage is is important. But if you can basically say, I know this is zone, I know this is man, I know this is a combination of zone and a man, and I know this is the first read he's looking at, here's his second and third read. And here's the position of the defender. Does he react in time to go to the next man? Or does he react in time to throw this ball with anticipation? You don't have to be able to tell me whether he's facing cloud or a or, or rollover of zone or anything that intricate because the quarterback's not thinking along those terms. <laughs> he's thinking about, you know, I mean, shoot, Brett Favre didn't even know what a nickel defense was. <laughs> I was you just know? about to say that. Yeah, yeah. It's and, and I've always subscribed to that idea. It's like the guy who practically invented the RPO didn't even know what a nickel defense is, you know, in terms, but he He's sure just could, out there playing, baby. He, he sure could see what was happening and, and figure it out and play with smarts. It just, he didn't, he just wasn't the guy that could diagram it for you. You know, right. and there are a lot of writers out there who are talented writers who can't diagram a sentence worth a lick, you know, and then there are lots of people who could diagram the hell out of a sentence and you would not want them writing for you. I worked with, <laughs> I, I, I won't say who, but I worked in the past with people who were unbelievable editors. Like they, they know the English language so well and they can label every term, grammatical punctuation style point. They are literally like the HB white style guide, you know, in a living form, but ask them to write a feature on a deadline and they have to lock themselves in a room and they're always <laughs> late and they can't get it done and they freak out, you know, and then yeah. there are some people who just can write, you know, and it's like, you, uh, you know, ask them what a dangling participle is and they probably will get it wrong, but ask them to craft a story that's good and it's grammatically, gr grammatically right. And maybe you have to do a little bit of editing here and there to, to, to really shine it up. But the, it's there and it's an enjoyable read and easy to read and and it has the rhythm and feel of yeah. everything. Same thing with quarterbacking. You know, yeah. Alex Smith probably could diagram everything to you, but the best thing he did for many years until recently was a check down. You know, so. sure, sure. Well, I didn't know what that what that word was that you dropped back there, so we drank. <laughs> <laughs> Dark, dangly participle is that what you Dang, said dangling participle yeah, yeah. something like no that. idea what that is yeah yeah me neither <laughs> <laughs> i'll google it later um i, I think we got about two more questions for you if you, you got enough time to stick sure, around let's do it let's do it okay um so you you we talked in the open about you know how this you are very analytical in, in your approach to watching film why so much emphasis on the film why why is why was that the thing that you really just locked in on and that was that was where you uh, that's where you do your work. Well, the, the, the quickest answer is the ball bounce is funny. So therefore it's not predictable. It's not a round ball. So <laughs> thank you. But thank yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank the, you. but the, but the actual answer is this, is that, you know, analytics are there to help you understand what you see on the field. They're there to, they're, they're there to kind of validate what's already happening on the field. And if it isn't to help you kind of investigate a little further, what questions you're asking or what you're looking at, but they are not the answer. They're, they're just a, they're just a lead off point to asking more questions. And so, you know, for me, when people, and what happens in our media industry with the analytics community is they have their, they lean too much on things like let's do marketable answers that are, that seem like cure-alls 
for the fantasy player or the football knowledge, which is the idea if you're a 6'2", if you're at least 6'2", and 212 pounds, and you have a certain amount of speed, then that's the kind of wide receiver you need to pick. No other team should be picking anybody who's smaller. Forget about Tyreek Hill. Forget about Steve Smith. Forget about Brandon Cooks. Forget about, you know, Antonio Brown. Anybody who was Those like, are all uh, outliers. And no, they're, they're all they outliers. To just be some of the best <laughs> players right. in the league. Exactly. Because they they got into this habit of court. They think they didn't realize that correlation doesn't equal causation. And so they they get too much into reverse engineering a lot of these um you know, a lot of these processes and they wind up marketing this and it's, and it makes it look kind of like th- this is the cure all answer. And there's grains of truth with a lot of the things that they're looking at, but it gets to a point where they also know they need to have a little bit of that, um, you know, that talk radio, political radio shtick going on to get an audience sucked in for right. it. And then also create some sort of argument or debate so that they can argue with people and get more attention through that argument. And they may even be better at arguing just in terms of the logic and the rhetoric than they are about their actual point that they're, that they've actually worked on. And, and there's some really great people who do analytics out there. I mean, there's some great work like Chase Stewart, who is um, with um, what is it called? Football perception. Um, who football perspective, who is out there. He does some really fine work. Matt Harmon, some of the work he did with reception perception really does some enlightening things. It's not, and he doesn't claim it's, you know, the answer to figuring out who a good wide receiver is, but Mm -hmm. those are examples of using film and using tape or using film to ask the right questions. So for me, when I look at, to me, the tape is about understanding how a player you're trying to draw a portrait of a player and part of that portrait is what he can do now what he might be able to learn to do where he fits and none of that weight's not going to tell me that 40 times not going to tell me that it's going to tell you know what those things are going to help me out in a sense where you know i look at the i look at the combine and and if if the numbers match what the player is doing, that's helpful. Huge check mark. It's a huge check mark, and it's a very important thing. If I can't tell you, I can't look at a running back and go, "Yeah, he runs a four point four six forty. I mean, nobody can do that, you know. And if you do, you know, There's go play the lottery. On Twitter. There's some people on Twitter who might argue that they can, but they can. But you know, <laughs> they've had a couple beers in them. They stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night, <laughs> right? So, you know, we know we know about that. You know, they were probably right next door to my dad. <laughs> and they both, and they're probably both, you know, they're probably both brigadier generals, gun instructors, and um, Wall Street experts. So, yeah, okay. and infectious disease experts too. And so, way better at diagnosing football than you, you know. Yeah, they they definitely are, and you know, and they and they will always and and I will guarantee you this: there will always be somebody on Twitter who will have the better answer about a player than I will. It will happen every single year. Of the course, you know. Of course. And, and there may be and there may be like, you yeah. know, you, you know, there could be somebody out there. But it's just like you said, everybody who watches football thinks they're the smartest yeah. guy uh, yeah. available. Yeah. So. so when it comes to looking at the, the analytics side, yeah, you're going to look at those numbers. And if they and that helps tell you how fast they are, are they? And then you also kind of have to look at the numbers with the level of you can't be too tight with them. One of the things that the NFL made mistakes with that I've heard talking about with certain scouts in former scouts is that sometimes they go, they've gone to the degree where if they've invited analytics people into the community where they start putting too many limiters into players and say, well, if the player doesn't run at least a, a four, you know, five forty, then we don't want them at all. Right. And suddenly you're eliminating the, elim- the Arian Foster from the equation. Mm-hmm. You're, you're eliminating or a good player who may not be a, a great fantasy player, but a good football player like Peyton Barber who can help out your team, you know, you're eliminating him from the equation or a Spencer yeah. Ware from the equation sure. or, or LeGarrette Blount or Joyk Bell or any of these guys that have been like CJ Anderson, serviceable players right. who can come in and produce at a high level at a cheap salary while somebody's hurt and not deliver much and not have much drop off. And you've, and if you, cut those guys out of your equation, then that means now you're getting 
instead of picking good football players who just happen to be slower than what you'd like for a starter, now you're getting guys who have speed for a starter but can't play football. And right. you know, and then you're then you're stuck with kick returners who can't run between the tackles. Sure. Right. Um, and that's and that's part of the problem with the analytics is that you have to again have ex- you have to understand how to apply it within the right amount of context. And football evaluation is more literature and poetry than it is hard science. You can yeah. incorporate the hard science into literature and poetry and to help come to a conclusion, just right. like what you do. You're a renovator. There's, you know, things don't always fit perfectly as measured. You know, you get wavy no. walls yeah. and you have to like, you have to refine things so that the, that yeah, the, the wall has to be dry. flatter. Yeah. If everything was 90 degrees. My life would be super easy. It's, yeah. It's, you, my it's, wife's doing all, you know, she's installing Wayne Scotting in our house right now and <laughs> redoing, you know, redoing stonework and all that stuff. And it's like, it's always that way. And it's like, right. there's a craft to it. And scouting is a craft, which means it's both art. And it also has some scientific principles involved when you have to combine yeah. both. But it's, it's your eyeballs. So it's all subjective and, and they're hard analytics. There's no way that those things could ever be any, any bit of subjective because they, there's no way they could have tailored their model to fit their narrative either. So no, I just no, find it, not. I just find it funny in yeah. that, uh, in that regard. Um, no, it right. will, it will, it will, you know, it will make you it will make you stronger it will grow hair on your head it will make you last longer all those different types of things you know and then when they collect the money you know make sure that your daughter's still and you know your daughter and your wife are still like in the house and that when they've left town that's all yeah. a million times yeah um <laughs> what i got a quick just note on Hakeem Butler. I know you were big on him when, when the situation doesn't pan out, like you were high on him. I, we were, I was super high on him. I loved him. I thought he could do so many things at his size. Um, obviously they bring in, uh, Deandre Hopkins and how could you not at the price tag that they did? I can't blame him when you can get a, one of the best players in football for how you got him. Good for you. But a guy like Hakeem Butler, who you were super high on, h- how do you deal with this right now? Yeah. You just, you kind of have to wait and see, or you, or you buy low. And because if you can buy low on a guy where it's where it's a situation where you're not giving up much for him and then you, you may end up with a, a great return on investment and nothing's mm-hmm. really lost as a result of the investment that you made in him. Just got to um, wait Larry Fitz out. You, you just got to wait Larry Fitzgerald out as a possibility. And and that's the thing. I mean, there was a lot to be said about him dropping the football and that he wasn't very good at being able to, that he had issues with that, and that maybe he was slow at being able to learn what they needed to do with the offense this year. Maybe that was something that had to do with it. But he hasn't been playing football yeah, that long. He he was a basketball star. Like he, we we went yeah. deep back into his his past and everything, and and he moved to Texas to for some reason, and and they were like, you should pick up football. Like he didn't even start playing football till pretty late in his high school career, and so for him to come out and and basically dominate yeah. on the college football field the way he did. I mean, it's going to be a huge jump, obviously, going into the pros. And, I mean, was he soup? Was he that injured, or did they put him on IR to kind of give him a year to kind of sit back Red and shirt. learn and grow? And, and like, yeah, yeah redshirt. I think it's a combination. I think I think Corey's right. It's probably more of a redshirt situation. Um, and that's fine. You know, right. we'll see what happens. I think sometimes we have to understand it does take a couple of years for players to get on there. We get very impatient about There is no patience. Nobody has league. patience. That's that's the yeah. key there. Yep. Dynasty leagues is the most ironic term for what we do because of the <laughs> fact that that everyone plays it like it's a redraft league. I, that's right. the it that's never, the thing. But it never ceases to amaze me how much recency bias plays into how people go about their dynasty teams. It's crazy. Well, remember Todd. Todd Gurley sucked apparently after his second year. Everybody was know. telling you to trade him. We we made a joke. We had it. We had a running joke on the show about tr- better trade Todd Gurley. We were just being sarcastic about it for like yeah. weeks on weeks on weeks. Like, don't trade Todd Gurley. This is this is insane. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even last year, I said, listen, I know everybody's worried about the knee, and he's probably not the same player, but. I bet you're going to be able to get top 15 production on him. I bet, and I have him as my number 12 running back. He was your number 12 running back last year. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't pretty. On the 31st ranked offensive line, according to PFS, at least. You yeah. Know? So everything went yeah. bad for him. The dude still had 250 carries. Yeah. No, he certainly didn't look yeah. like the old Todd Gurley, but he's still a good player. He's 25. Yeah. I like what the 
the, the Falcons are doing with their offensive line. They got some first round capital. They got some other good players over there. He might be, yeah, he might be solid again this year. I mean, yeah. or good this year. He just might, he's thinking he may be elite. We'll see. I mean, I, that'd yeah. be a little bit of a surprise, but I'm not, you know, people like to say it's the same thing. Same with, with Adrian Peterson, you know, for years I go, Adrian Peterson isn't done. He just doesn't, didn't have a good line in, in with Minnesota when he got that brief little bit of sunshine with the, with the Cardinals. Um, and with Carson Palmer, he looked like the same old Adrian Peterson to me on the field. He was running through people, running around them, running over them. And still, yeah. as the old man now, I mean, he looks like, you know, he looks like a 57 Chevy getting run into by a bunch of, like, fiberglass cars, you know. I mean, they, and it's they're all tank. getting totaled. And he's just like, let me pop out the, let me pop out the bump in the, in, the, in, the, in the car door here and keep yeah. going. That's, it's amazing to watch. It's fun. All right, last question for you because this was one of my favorite little parts of your uh, RSP, and um, I really wanted to just get your general. We talked a lot about running backs. What are your general thoughts about the running back position in the NFL currently? Because I just feel like there's a lot of people who just love to hate on this position, and you, you cited it in your column there that you know people have wrote written some wrote, written some uh, articles about how they don't matter and blah 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 blah, but really like. Uh, we champion the cause of running backs. We, we think that they matter a lot. We think that they're underappreciated. You could pay Adam Humphreys $10 million and nobody cares. But if you pay a running back $10 million, everybody's mad. Like, so just your general thoughts on the running back position in the NFL currently. Yeah. I mean, I understand the argument that they may matter less than they used to back in the seventies and eighties and their, and the nineties when I was growing up and watching this game where you give it to one guy and he, and, you know, he had several years and they played until basically their leg fell off. And, <laughs> and, you know, that was, and those guys were true warriors. And, and now that they've softened the rules for defenses or for offenses so that you can basically interference is like, is much easier to get a call for, or, and that, you know, they can't really play f as physical as they once could against wide receivers you know, that's open. You can't the hit field. the quarterback. You can't hit the quarterback. So Makes it you easier to pass. Yeah, of course. So of course that means that you're going to have rules in favor of, of passing the football and that running is going to, to be a, you're going to do that less often. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at the same time to say that it doesn't matter also means that you're not really seeing the entire field in terms of how, and I understand that play action, the threat of play action, even if you're not running the ball well, yields gains and it, and it, and it's productive. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is you still, when a player can run one uh, for one, you know, you do have short yardage situations that matter. You have end of game situations that matter. You know, you look at what the Titan, you look at the teams that have been sex successful and Super Bowl winning teams in recent years, even even in the past 10 years after they soften the rules, you're still looking at the Baltimore's, the Pittsburgh's, the San Francisco's that have gotten there. You're looking at the the New England Patriots who ran the ball a, a, a ton, the Atlanta Falcons who ran the ball a the ton. The Rams when they got the Rams. there. Yes. So running the ball sets up so many different things because you're creating looks that looks that are similar between run and pass and it forces defenses to account for that. And they still can't, the analytics people can't really measure that impact and that movement and that thought process well enough to really show how that registers. And then also at the end of game, because again, when you're closing out a game and you've worn down a defense and, and they say, Oh, it's not really worn down. Well, you need to watch defensive backs when they don't want to tackle Derrick Henry and what that looks like. Because right. They, they, you know, you just have to learn to understand what's the difference between a good tackle and one where someone's like, I'm just trying to wrap and hang on because I don't want to hit. I'm sore. I'm yeah. sore and I'm tired. I've had enough. You know, I've had enough, you know, I mean, and those are things that you have to kind of learn to study and, and understand that you, you know, the analytics people may not be experts in what um, the art of tackling is. You know, and what a good tackle or bad tackle is. They may just look at some of the, the drills that they're looking at and see a guy leaving his feet and hitting someone hard and going, oh, that's a great tackle. When you're like, well, technically, that's not even a good tackle. Um, <laughs> you know, you, know, you got to have your feet in the ground. You got to have your head up. You want to be able to be at a certain angle. You want to be able to drive through all these different football things that show you when those aren't happening and the guy had every opportunity to get in position to do those things, but there's someone bearing down on him. Business decision. Exactly. 
He made a business decision, and those business decisions come in the third and fourth quarter of games when a guy's gotten the ball and they're and they're being able to tear through people. Look at the Tennessee Titans through the playoffs this year. I mean, I didn't work out all the way because you met this eventual Super Bowl champions, but I mean, again, running got you where you were going. Yeah, uh, so exactly. I, I believe it's a very valuable thing still, and you're right. I mean, there's definitely it is easier to pass the ball, but I, I also feel like there's a lot of non-quantifiable things that the running back does and, that. And people don't understand what a good running back does. Like I hear these things about Ezekiel Elliott not being a good, being a, a top back, and it's just like that's ridiculous. Ezekiel <laughs> Ezekiel Elliott is one of the best backs in football, and when you look at what he does in terms of situations to create, even behind his good offensive line, when the line wasn't as good. You know, there's these things like micro movements. One of the things that I know I've talked about, Jay Moyers talked about, um, and it's it's the small movements where you're where you may be dipping the shoulder ever so slightly, or you're making a cut and a slight little turn of the hips to avoid the defender being able to even get a hand on you in addition to the move that you make. These small little moves, Alvin, Alvin Kamara is absolutely great at it. Um, you know, and the ability to do these things to create yardage is a you know, separates top backs. And it's also about being able to diagnose and turn gains out of losses, transform losses into gains. And, and they do that very, very well. And what I think a lot of people don't understand is that there's a lot of running back talent in the league, you know, and there's very few opportunities to play that position. And so as a result of that, yeah, you can get some guys who are free agents and it's kind of like shooting guards in the NBA. You can get them off the street And they can probably give you some production in a given week. They may not be able to give you the same level of production as these top starters, but there's, but that's the point is that there are a lot of guys who can play, but there's very few positions for them to be able to maximize. And there's also, it's also hard to be able to do all the different skills that are demanded of running backs. And that's why they also do things with committees and it's a high injury position. Right. So, if the, if anything, the whole don't pay a running back, the only argument I would have is there is that they've discovered that these guys can't stay healthy because it's a demanding position, and therefore they, they'd rather be wrong about letting them go too early and yeah. caught holding the bag. Then got caught holding the bag. All yeah. right, man. Well, I really appreciate what you got, Jay. I was just going to say I really love the analogy that you had in the, in the rookie scouting portfolio. Again, hit him up. Matt Waldman, RSP.com. You got to read that scouting portfolio uh, about how the talent of running backs in the NFL. You compared it to like if a, if a running back walked into an acting audition, the guys that are there is like Brad Pitt and uh, I, I can't remember all the actors you Dustin named Hoffman off. Dustin Hoffman and right. Benedict Cumberbatch and <laughs> Leo. You know, you know, yeah, all the, all the, you know, a whole bunch all a listers all the a listers exactly and then if if they want to go a different direction they can hit clive owen or J- J- uh anthony bordeaux or edward norton like it was just there's but 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 wider or uh, quarterbacks like there's just like b-roll people in there and, and anybody that can remotely meet the criteria is a first round pick and you compare <laughs> yeah, like let, yeah leonardo what, dicaprio in that quentin tarantino movie you know where he's like playing, once upon a time in hollywood on hollywood you know his his actor in that version would probably be like a quarterback you <laughs> right. know, yeah. in the league in that comparison. Man, I got to rewatch that thing because I watched all three hours of it or whatever. And I, I didn't understand. I didn't know what I, I feel like I missed something because I didn't get it. I didn't, I don't know what, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. <laughs> Well, we got time on our hands now. That's for sure. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> There's ever a time to wa- rewatch a three hour movie. Now's the time. <laughs> I just went back to True Detective, so that's oh nice. I just started. Wa- I watched the first season of that, and then I'm going to go to. The, I I skipped the second season because I heard it wasn't yeah. great, but I may oh. wa- go watch that. But I love the third season. The third, third season was, was the third was a good bounce back there. Yeah, third was good. Second second's okay. And okay, that's okay. Okay, I'll give it. A shot. All right, all right. Well, Mr. Waldman, we'll. Uh, well, thank you for joining us. And uh, no, <laughs> no, man, I really appreciate it. Thank you for hanging out for so long. I know for real. Uh, you ran, yeah, you ran a half pleasure. marathon with us, and we appreciate it. I hope those nipples are all right. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, unlike Ed Helms, I think I don't, I don't wear those kind of shirts. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, he got the reference. I like it. All right. Well, again, check him out on Twitter at Matt Waldman. Make sure you go by the Rookie Scouting Portfolio because there is so much useful information over there. It's, you can find it at MattWaldmanRSP.com. This guy's been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. I hope to see you again if you're ever in charleston 
please hit us up and we can go down to Revelry, which is our one of our sponsors. It's a great little beer spot and, and, and enjoy a beverage if if that's what you so desire, or we can just hit the beach. And yeah. uh, we, but but again, man, we really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy, and uh, but you're the man, so we yeah. really appreciate it. I appreciate it. you guys. Ask great questions. It was a fun program. You guys are just you know fun to hang out with and. And uh, I think we'll avoid the beach because you can see I just went out on my deck and I look purple right now. (laughs) (laughs) Too much time in the film cave, I think. Yeah. All right, man. Well, stay safe out there. And uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks again, Matt. Thank you.